a preferential treatment for those oppressed or discriminated section of the Indian society and others. Uh, the way in which the language policy evolved, the way in which uh, the the the, uh, uh, the question of representation, uh, reservation for Dalits, etc., etc. Figure. I mean, if you look at all these debates, you discover that there is a majority. I mean, please remember, it was it was not an elected constituent assembly which was elected on universal suffrage. It was on a partial suffrage of those who were educated Indians. It was elected and two-thirds of it was dominated by the Congress party. So they had a brute majority to push through anything that they wanted. It's a myth that Dr. Ambedkar wrote this constitution because Dr. Ambedkar's lament was that the constitution I wanted is not this constitution that came into being. It's Sardar Patel and Jawaharlal Nehru's imprint on this constitution much more than anybody else's. And the coterie around uh, Sardar Patel with K.M. Munshi and many of the other right-wing uh, thinkers. So if you read the Constituent Assembly debate, it comes out so clearly. It strikes you that on all important discussions and debates in the Constituent Assembly, there were these efforts. So they, they, knew, they knew what they were engaged in, that they wanted to create an Indian nation state. This was the project that the Congress had set for itself. This is the project that the Indian Constitution set for itself. In bringing this about, in moving in that direction, it created a whole lot of problems for itself without realizing or realizing it. And deliberately, because why would otherwise sedition have come back? Within a year of Constitution ruling it out, within eight, sorry, 16 months, with the First Amendment, sedition is back into operation in the Indian law, which the Constitution had removed. Because even when the debate was going on, the, many people expressed that it may actually be necessary for the Indian state to retain the sedition law because it will come in handy to deal with all kind of uh, situations. So they were very, very wary. And within 16, 16 months of the passage of the Indian Constitution, see, the First Amendment brought back sedition into, which is ridiculous. How can a republic which is based on this whole notion of popular sovereignty have sedition? How can people become seditious? If people are the sovereigns in a republic, how do they become seditious? The government can become. One of the most remarkable, I mean, it's, it's, it's a wrong example I'm choosing. One of the very interesting things I find about the American constitution is when the Amazon, I mean, the Arizona state filed a case uh, uh, condemning the, I mean, charging the U.S. federal government with treason. On the Immigration Act, they went to the Supreme Court. Of course, they, that wasn't held. But what I'm trying to say is that for us to imagine that in India, I mean, we would be ridiculed. Then how can you? Because we follow the British tradition. The state, the empire, that tradition still continues. We don't believe in due process, so our judiciary is not as independent or completely independent. Not that it has helped the United States, that's a separate matter. India, the US Supreme Court is probably one of the most reactionary judiciary on earth. That's the one which upheld Jim Crow, didn't it? Uh, in, the, in the 20th century, I mean, we may rem read fantastic Supreme Court judgments which are remarkable in terms of the liberal principles, but we can't be oblivious of that reality where the same Supreme Court has also made one of the most, I mean, they passed the most uh, reactionary judgments of all kinds. Look at the drug law where they upheld life sentence for a first time crime. It's absurd. And India, India is no better. Indian Supreme Court's record is abominable. I mean, we can cite TUCL case and this case and that case, but the reality is that in effect, none of this works. The police officer in Bastar, he says, Supreme Court may have passed a judgment, but we are not bothered by it. How are they bothered? Supreme Court in the PUCL judgment, let me just read out a quote from that. I mean, you would, we would think, oh, what a Supreme Court we have. What a fantastic Indian constitution and remarkable Indian judiciary, right? What did the uh, Supreme Court uh, say about uh, uh, in this PUCL versus? Uh, uh, I just want to read out and then end because I'm, I'm sure that you must be getting bored also with all these long.
Uh -huh. Which the Supreme Court, this is PUCL versus Union of India 1997. It's a celebrated case in India and all the civil liberties and human rights organizations take pride in this. Look at our great Indian constitution. But look at the flip side then. Court, is it open to the state to deprive a citizen? This is a case where from the, from the court itself it will become clear what I'm talking about. Court, is it open to the state to deprive the citizen of his life and liberty and yet claim an immunity on the ground that the said de deprivation of life occurred while the officers of the state were exercising the sovereign power of the state? This was the question before the court. It ruled, the Supreme Court ruled that fundamental right to life guaranteed by Article 21 will be defeated by pleading the archaic defense of sovereign functions. Okay? We think Article 22 does not recognize any exception. But despite this brilliant judgment, and I mean, I mean the pros and all would attract us, you know, and fill us with great joy and in the great judiciary. But what was the practical impact of this? Nothing. Zero. Because the same Supreme Court says that they, the, the state does not have immunity. But the Supreme Court has actually passed, they have not overturned <coughs> other judgments which provided legal immunity. So what is this? Sometimes our judges find an opportunity and they decide to write a treatise. So you will find that the operative part of the judgment, the prayer, is ineffective. It's, it's very minor. It's like that famous Chhattisgarh judgment of the Supreme Court on the Salva Judu, SPOs. Ridiculous judgment. He went into his propounding his own theory and philosophy of life. But what was the operative part? That a 10th standard, unless the person is 10th standard pass, I mean that was only technical ground on which that, that was struck down. The SPOs, the special police officers appointment was struck down by saying that because they had not uh, passed 10th standard. So what did the state government do? Lowered the standard to six and they created auxiliary force. And what does the Supreme Court do? It is going to entertain a contempt petition which the petitioners have filed. When the time comes, we'll see what the Supreme Court says. So we have fantastic judgments, but the operative parts are pity. That is a problem. So self, to so come back to your original question, Paul, and then I, I think you must, must all be tired of that. Self and other is also created by the state. They create the enemy. When you send the troops, you do not just tell them, you tell them, when you tell them that you are fighting, I mean, whom are they fighting in, in the Adivasi uh, heartland of central India? Maoists. Right? Who are Maoists? So suddenly they are demons. They are terrorists. Now, you can't equate them with Pakistan and Muslims. So, you have to employ other uh, you see that clip of the brigadier in Red and Dream? Yes. That's the, uh, see? <laughs> and did you see how the soldiers are trained and how the, uh, the dogs are trained? And see the similarity between the two? Did you notice that? I mean, one of the brilliant part of that documentary. In the documentary, there's that scene where they show these dogs being trained. And you also see that soldiers being trained. And there is this interview with Brigadier Ponva. He's very proud of his boys. This is Sanjay Kaag's red Sanjay Kaag's red, uh, okay. uh, red and red. Yeah. They, 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 it, they create, they create enemy and the other. So it's not just a cultural uh, thing that, you know, Kashmiri Muslims, you know, even Kashmiri Muslims who are fighting for the right of self-determination, they're fighting Indian occupation. It's a very clearly politically articulated position. It's not an Indian cultural entity they are fighting or Indian civilization. They are fighting Indian occupation by an Indian state. It's a very political concept. Whereas Indian intelligentsia says we are fighting Muslim fundamentalism in Kashmir, which is backed by Pakistan. Cultural argument is being advanced by, and that is what we do. I mean, when Muslims, this whole argument against war against terror, also is a large part of this is based on culturalist explanation no? that it's intrinsic to Islam. One section, the right wing says, the hardliner says that it's intrinsic in Islam, that it's anti-democratic and therefore it would not, 
it is it is reactionary and therefore you have to fight it and crush it the reformist muslims say well islam is not bad it's only bad muslims who are practicing bad islam so it's they are trapped in the same continuum it's not state creates this that is that is what i believe i believe that this otherness and the difference between self and otherness is something which is deliberately promoted as part of a deliberate part of 